All right, let's go ahead and get started with session two. And I'm going to turn it over to the chairs who are James Fitzgerald from Janelia and Daniel Fisher from Stanford. Hello everyone, uh, my name is James Fitzgerald. I'm one of the chairs for this session titled Heterogeneity, Sloppiness and Variability in Biological Systems. The word sloppiness references the idea that many parameters are gonna be needed to specify a biological system mechanistically, yet relatively few of them may actually ultimately matter for a function. And so a major theme of this session is gonna be exploring whether sloppiness is a bug of under-constrained models versus an essential feature of real biological systems. And our first speaker will be Yunliang Zhang from Eve Martyr's lab at Brandeis University. Uh, should I start right now? Yep, go for it. Okay, so uh, thank you. So I did my PhD thesis in cardiac modeling and then transitioned into uh, computational neuroscience. So today I will summarize uh, the, pro the research progress in cardiac modeling after I have left that field. And then uh, discuss how progress in cardiac modeling and neuroscience modeling may help us understand the general issues uh, of individual variability and stability of biological systems. So uh, just like uh, other biological systems that uh, gener generate electrical signals, a cardiac modeling starts from the classical uh, Hodgkin Huxley model. And after that, over the past 70 years, people have built models from a single cell uh, to the organ level. So cardiac myocytes are composed of ion channels, which can generate action potentials when receiving stimuli. And th this signal can propagate to other cells through gap junctions. So when the heart functions normally, uh, uh, this signal can propagate through the whole ventricle like a wave. However, under some disease conditions, uh, some abnormalities can occur in the form of early after depolarization called early after depolarization at the cellular level and the reentrant wave at the organ level. So um, cardiac modelers only started considering individual variability about seven years ago, motivated by my supervisor, Eve Mother, a neuroscience researcher. And before that, people use species average and population average data to build average models. So this kind, uh, these average models uh, help us understand how a system can work under normal conditions, but they are limited in predicting how individuals respond to perturbations. And here is an example of HU cell. So their shapes are regular, you know, uh, but, uh, but their size, I mean, the shape is regular like a cylinder, but their size does vary in length and diameter. And more importantly, the action potentials generated by cardiomyocytes uh, are variable. So these gray traces were measured in 29 cells from 35 patients. And I don't know how many of you think this tra uh, these traces are similar. At least if you are from the field of neuroscience, you may uh, argue they are just similar single spikes. But in the heart, the action potential uh, duration is very important for contraction force generation, and they show different vulnerability to cardiac arrhythmia. And by saying this, I'm not uh, uh, excluding the shape of action potential or electrical signals in other biological systems, such as in the brain, is not important. And underlying the, the action potential shape variations, the transient outward potassium current and the L-type calcium current also show variations uh, by six and three folds. And the other unshown main currents are also variable. And here I also show you three very um, famous average uh, HU cell models. So although these cell models uh, definitely fitted some data quite well when they built the models, but uh, you can see these three models don't fit this data set quite well. So this uh, raises another question. So how can we uh, account for the variability between different data sets? So uh, early stage drug safety prediction is very important for, uh, for drug development. And given the limited accuracy and ethical problems in animal models. So human-based computer models can uh, 
provide a cheap and potentially effective alternative. And the current modelers have started testing drug safety by building a population of cellular models. And then just like, like modeling in other systems. So how can we get good enough models that, that are sufficiently constrained uh, to make a biological sense and still capture the uh, variability? So by varying the conductance of the ion currents, uh, they use uh, the resting memory potential, the peak of the action potential, the shape and the duration of action potential properties to build the model database. So then they tested uh, the model responses to 60, uh, 62 antiarrhythmic drugs, all of which affect specific cardi uh, cardiac ion channels. So after applying a drug, if the response is a great curve, it means the drug is safe. However, if the response is a purple uh, curve called early after depolarization, that's arrhythmogenic and that can cause uh, TDP, sorry, I couldn't pronounce it. So uh, this page summarized the, the drug safety uh, 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 predictions. So this platform can have a prediction accuracy of 88%. So basically, uh, the higher the values, the higher risk of the TDP. And according, and from the simulation results, these drugs are safe and these drugs are at high risk. Um, the, but the green dots here and the, right, the red dots here, I mean, the predictions are correct. For, for example, for these five drugs, I mean, for the uh, model simulations, actually they provide fake negative. They should be here. So the next question is how can we improve the prediction accuracy. So right now the, the data are, are from different hearts, although they are from humans. So I guess if some organization can provide uh, a population of data that includes cellular action material properties, uh, uh, current properties in same cells within the same and uh, between different hearts, that will definitely help. So uh, individual variability uh, exists in all biological systems at different uh, spatial scale. And we always try to ask, so what's the benefit and what's the cause of the individual variability? So in the brain, it has poses a challenge for us to understand how a system with widely variable components can develop into a similar functioning system. And how can the function be maintained uh, with minor perturbations? And here, let's see whether a heart needs the individual variability. So in this example, the authors use ventricle models to simulate the, for, the formation of reentrant wave. So in uh, two patients after myocardial infarction. So the formation of the reentrant wave is caused by the different excitability of the, uh, the cells in the red normal, yellow scar, and the gray border zones. And these are the morphology from the MRI data, and these are the simulated time sequence of electrical signal propagation. So their target is to try to find some ablation size to block this uh, reentrant wave because they are they cause cardiac arrhythmia. So um, as I mentioned earlier, so intercellular variability does exist in the real heart. So in principle, if we want to simulate how the heart Oh, sorry, how, uh, so how the heart works and find the optimal ablation size. In principle, this model should include the ionic current, cellular and morphological um, heterogeneity. But in this model, it only uh, includes the personalized morphology. But amazingly, uh, computer, model, uh, computer model suggested uh, ablation size are fewer and more accurate compared with the size the doctors have, uh, have tried. So in other words, a ventricle model with homogeneous cells can do the right job and make reliable predictions. Then, so does it mean the, the current and the cellular variability only matters at a lower scale and will be averaged at a higher scale? So uh, homeostasis, uh, widely uh, exists in uh, living systems and is well studied in neuroscience. So it has been uh, proposed to compensate for the perturbations and may explain how neurons uh, 
uh, achieve similar firing patterns with variable conductances. However, homeostasis can occur at the cellular and the network level. So does it mean homeostasis reduces the individual variability at a higher level by maintaining a similar activity target? So in other words, individual variability is more sloppiness of the biological system rather than necessary uh, property of the biological system. And in the brain, we may argue the individual variability can help the brain to implement different jobs or for functional degeneracy. However, for other organs, uh, such as the heart, the task is same, although really challenging. So the heart needs to collect uh, blood and then pump into the body. And at the cellular level, they need to avoid uh, the occurrence of early after depolarization. So in this context, will organs doing simpler jobs, they need less variability compared with the uh, complicated brain, unless you want the heart to think, right? So in addition, so how homeostasis can help the heart, uh, I mean, so the heart faces like a, a channel, uh, channel protein uh, turnover gene mutation and how homeostasis can help the heart to maintain the function over 70 years. And in a complex neuron model, we still couldn't well predict what's the capacity of the homeostasis. In other words, which channel deletion can't be compensated, but can we better understand it in an organ you know, that uh, does simpler jobs? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, finally, I would like to thank my, uh, my supervisor, Eve, who really gave me a tremendous help. Thanks, thank you. Great, thanks, Yunang. We have uh, time for questions. Would anybody like to kick us off? Yeah, maybe I could start with one, since you brought up the question of what's going on on different uh, time scales and which variability is important. And you showed the uh, a figure with a lot of the the neurons and their action potentials versus time, and then some of the some of the models. Um, and one of the things of I guess there is that the, the 200 millisecond time scale over which they differ is not that much shorter than the time scale for a for a heartbeat. Um, and so I wanted to ask how much is known about what's really important about those time scales and whether the models are really assuming different things or are they just using parameters that are different than the ones you're showing? Uh, okay, actually uh, for that slide, I, I'm sorry, maybe I, made, I didn't make it clear. Actually, those data are from the cardiac myocytes. So I mean, right. the so their action potentials are like you know several hundred milliseconds. Like in in uh, in the ventricle, the action potentials are about like 250, and here uh, in the in the atrium, the action potentials are shorter. But still, they are much much wider compared with the spikes in our brain. Because th these are several hundred milliseconds, and in our brain, it's only several milliseconds or even shorter. No, I, I was I was asking them compared to the basic time scale for a heartbeat. Yeah, so they're I mean, not much, they're a substantial fraction of that, and whether the 200 millisecond part then really matters or not. It, it matters because the action potential duration will change according to the heartbeat uh, heartbeat rate. So if you beat faster, if you have the heartbeat faster, the action potential will accordingly narrow a little bit. But the, the different the different duration of, of action potentials, they uh, on one hand they will affect the calcium transition generated by the, by the myocyte, and that will affect the contraction force of the heart. This is one thing. And the other thing is, the, uh, I mean, usually the wider action potentials, they can provide a substrate for uh, some, uh, some abnormalities to occur. It's called early after depolarization, as I have shown you the, the, the examples. I see. Thank you. Yeah, I can ask a question too. So I thought it was interesting how you talked about how individual variability affects cardiac physiology. Um, but then when you got to the cardiology example with the personalized treatment, you said that a lot of those microscopic details didn't seem to kind of really be necessary to account for. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about, you know, circumstances when microscopic variability may start to matter. And so you kind of showed these, you know, personalized, uh, you know, sorry, non-personalized, but population model drug developments. And do you think it's possible, for example, you could, uh, for example, you know, have an individual model that you could use to kind of figure out what types of drugs would be good for one patient or another? 
Yeah, I, I think you make the point. So for example, at the whole organ level or, you know, under some conditions, I think uh, do at some scale, you know, the cellular variability are averaged at the organ level, you know, in some degree. So in some uh, circumstances, we, uh, for some purpose, we don't need those details. But for drug development, definitely we need those kind of, you know, individual variability because as I discussed in the, in, uh, in the starting of the talk. So, I mean, right now it's kind of uh, average models for the cellular for the cellular models, right? So they couldn't really, uh, we couldn't predict how indi individual cells or individual persons respond to uh, different drugs. So okay. definitely, I mean, that's the future, but I, I think it's pretty challenging to, to get a model like that because it's very easy to get a personalized heart morphology, right? And compared with in the heart, you, you want to get all the, I mean, of course, we don't need to get all the cell properties, but even like within the same heart, we get a population of, you know, what's the distribution of the properties. If we get that, I think that will also help. But right now it seems due to the, uh, the limited access of the data, I think. So we have very limited data about that thing. So, so how cells, I mean, what's the distribution of the action potential like variation in a single, in a single heart? I, I think we lack this information. Interesting. Great. Well, I think that that's a good time to stop and move to the next speaker. So thanks again for your talk. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so the next speaker is Ben Makta, who's a professor of both physics and systems biology at Yale, which is, I think, rather relevant for what he's been doing, and he's going to explain to us what sloppiness really means. Uh, thank you. You guys see my screen? Hopefully. Yes. yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah. So um, uh, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. This has been a very uh, exciting and very different conference. Um, so indeed, I'm going to be um, trying to explain why it is that simple sort of cartoonish models work. Um, and I want to start with this um, uh, schematic for a model of, of growth factor signaling in PC12 cells. Um, this is from a paper from, from Jim Sethno's group. Um, and uh, in, in this model, uh, when, when these different growth factors arrive, um, they trigger a signaling cascade. Um, all of these boxes and circles here are components that get phosphorylated and activated, um, uh, and, and eventually leads to the phosphorylation and nuclear import of ERK here. Um, and uh, if you zoom in on this a little bit, um, what you can see is that each of these boxes and circles are components, and all of the arrows represent interactions. Um, and, and in total, there's about 48 parameters, or exactly 48 parameters in this model. Um, and and I, I, uh, I want you to think about what this means. And in particular, I think you could, uh, uh, or it's important to note that this really is a vast simplification of reality. Um, so this is an image I, I shamelessly stole from Open Organelle, um, where there's a lot of um, really striking images. Um, this isn't from a PC12 cell, but um, it's another eukaryotic cell. Um, and, and I think you should just take from this that the cell uh, has its own internal life um, that surely interacts with the components of this cascade. Um, and surely, um, you know, whatever is happening here um, is impacting what's happening in this cascade, even though it's not in the model. Um, and um, I also like this picture, which shows another um, piece which isn't in this, which is that there's you know, a huge diversity of, of proteins in the cell. Um, many of these are also interacting um, with, with the components um, in this cascade um, um, in ways that are not at all in this model. OK, um, so that's one view. But I think when physicists view this, um, often they get a very different impression, um, which is that this model is actually way too complicated. Um, so this model was motivated by uh, these data points here. Um, and, and a few other similar experiments. And if you look at these curves, um, these are not 48 parameter curves, right? These have a height, they have a width. Um, uh, what, what's important about the difference is, is the time scale of, of the response. Um, but these are, these are small parameter curves. Um, and, and you could worry that if you're fitting these with 48 parameters, um, you're gonna really overfit things and that your, you know, your model results are not gonna mean much. Um, but you can notice that, that looking at this, um, uh, this model is not overfitting the data, um, or it's not at least perfectly overfitting the data. Um, and so um, we'll set this aside for now. 
Um, one thing I want to stress here is that this situation is not particular to biology. Um, so what you're looking at here is a small molecule um, from a molecular dynamic simulation that's, that's moving around in water. Um, and, and all you should take from this is that water is actually quite complicated. Um, there's this hydrogen bond network. Um, there's very complicated interactions between uh, a solute and, and water. Um, but if the only thing you care about um, is, is the motion of, of, uh, of the solute particle, um, you can get by with a much simpler description. And that's the diffusion equation. So all of the complexity um, in water really enters into this only through this one parameter, D. Um, and, and so I want to uh, uh, stress what, what it is um, that makes these, or what's the same about these two systems that needs to be explained. So first, um, the effective dimension of their model behavior is much smaller than the number of parameters. Um, and, and, and in the biological example, the curves were only a, a few dimensional, even though um, the parameter space was much larger. Um, there are simpler reduced models, which make equivalent predictions. So um, that's really clear in the case of, 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 of diffusion. Um, um, and then finally, quantitative understanding of system behavior does not require accurate parameters. So um, you could measure a diffusion constant of a particle um, much more easily um, then you could extract it from a molecular dynamic simulation like this. Okay, and, and what I'm going to be telling you about next is that both of these models share a common universal structure, um, which, which allows this to happen. Um, and this is going to lead to a hierarchy of, of parameter importance um, uh, that's really responsible for these features. Okay, so um, uh, as an example where we can really calculate this, this model manifold, um, uh, uh, which explains this, uh, I want you to think about an even simpler system um, where I'm trying to fit a sum of two exp exponentials to data. Um, so my model looks something like this. I'm assuming that uh, uh, at time points t, the rate of, of radioactive decay is going to be given by the sum of two exponentials. And I'm going to uh, try and understand uh, these two parameters, uh, k1 and k2. Um, and, and my assumption is that I'm going to, um, my model predicts um, that I will see uh, this plus a little bit of, of Gaussian noise. Um, so uh, if I specify the parameters, uh, that predicts a curve something like this. Um, but I can also think about the model manifold. Um, and the model manifold is what you get, um, uh, uh, or the model manifold has every point corresponding to a particular set of parameter values. Um, here it is for this particular case. And the distance between two parameters is going to be a measure of how distinguishable their data are. So in this plot, models which are close by um, make similar predictions. They'd be hard to distinguish in an experiment. Um, and, and, and models which are far apart make very different predictions, um, which you could easily tell apart in an experiment. Um, and it turns out that the distance in this space um, is locally given by the Fisher information metric. Um, uh, so uh, if, if you know uh, differential geometry, um, this is really a Riemannian geometry um, uh, uh, where, where the metric is given by the Fisher information, um, which locally measures the distinguishability as I change parameters. Okay, so what I was showing you in the last slide um, was, was the uh, model manifold for a two parameter sum of exponentials uh, uh, looked at at two time points. Um, but uh, here is, is a similar model manifold, but now for a sum of three exponentials. And, um, and, and this is typical. These model manifolds have a hyperribbon structure. So in this example, there's a long direction, an intermediate direction, and then a third dimension that you can barely see here. Um, and if I could plot this in higher dimensions, you'd see them keep getting thinner and thinner. Um, and remember that long dimensions are relevant for system behavior, so they could be measured from data. Um, um, and they're not likely aligned with the bare parameter axes. Um, and short directions, uh, which this model has, has one of, but a higher parameter model would have many of, um, these can't be measured from data. Um, and, and conversely, uh, they could be wrong without hurting the performance of your model. OK, um, so uh, to see how this happens, um, in, in the second of these examples of diffusion, um, we made just a really cartoonized uh, model of this. So, um, so there's two types of particles, blue and red particles. Every time step, a blue particle um, hops to somewhere within a blue within a square of its current position. 
Um, and the red particles hop to somewhere within a triangle. To, so you should think of this as a stand-in for this complicated microscopics. Um, and after a single time step, you could easily tell whether you were looking at blue particles or red particles just by looking at their distribution. Um, but if you know the central limit theorem um, and you know that I matched the diffusion constant here, um, after some time, these would look similar. Um, and if we look at the model manifolds of these, um, after a single time step, um, these particles or, or the, the models corresponding to blue and red particles are far apart. Um, but as time evolves, um, they get close to each other and the whole model manifold contracts onto this two-dimensional space of diffusion and drift. Um, so a question you could ask is whether simpler models are available here. Um, and, and in a hyperribbon, it turns out that every point is close to an edge. Um, so uh, here uh, in this sum of exponentials, looking a little bit more closely, um, this infinite parameter space is really mapped um, all onto this uh, finite data space. Um, and, and the edges of this um, are actually simpler models with one less parameter. Um, so this edge, this long edge here, is where I have just a single exponential. Um, these two edges here uh, are when one of the parameters has gone to either zero or infinity. Um, and this may seem rather specific to the sum of exponentials, um, but in fact, it is not. Um, and and uh, uh, what Mark Cranstrom showed in this really elegant paper um, is that you can do this for much more complicated models. So he took this model that I showed you at the beginning. Um, he started at these initial parameters, and then he calculated geodesics, went to the closest boundary of the model manifold, and iteratively did this. Um, and, 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 and by doing this, um, he could automatically reduce this more complicated model to a much smaller model. This one actually has 12 parameters um, uh, uh, that, that describes the model on this edge here. OK, so I, I want to conclude by just uh, uh, talking about what this means. And I think uh, one of the major takeaways from this is that every system and behavior really has to be understood on its own level. Um, and, and for thinking about how, how to think about tissues, a tissue is really both more and less than the sum of its cells. So some things which are really important at the cellular level might not be so important for the tissues um, and vice versa. Um, and, and, and really just highlighting this again, microscopic details are neither necessary nor sufficient to, to understand uh, behavior at a higher level. Um, I want to just say a little bit about uh, uh, most of this talk has been about what's the same about biological systems and non-biological systems. Um, but biological systems are evolved for function, and that means there are likely to be um, many different interesting things that you could measure about a single system. Um, and and uh, I think uh, I don't want to say what all theory should be, but a theory to my tastes um, I think should really identify what the function is that a system has evolved to do, um, and also identify the constraints that limit its performance. So, um, you know, what what are the trade-offs that that the system needs to face? Um, and then a good model should be an edge that's that's near to the specifics of the real system, um, in the sense that it faces similar um, uh, constraints and and has a similar function. Um, uh, and and with that, I guess I'm a minute over time. Um, so I'll stop and take questions. Thank you, Ben. So just a reminder to the general audience who can put questions in the um, uh, in the Q and A, and we don't think we have any of it at this point. So um, I just maybe could start with a, a question. So you talked about sort of parameters and being near the um, near the edge, and which parameters matter. But I wonder whether it's usually the um, situation where it's a parameter that, that matters, or is it some combination of parameters and can sometimes be a complicated combination that uh, matters and how you would think about uh, think about that? Yeah, um, uh, one, one, uh, one, one, I guess, key point is that um, uh, the, the long axes are, are the, the long axis of, of these hyper ribbons. Um, those are the axes that matter for, um, for, for, for your experiment or, or for the system behavior that you're considering. Um, but there's no reason to think that they should be closely aligned with, with the parameters that would have microscopic names. Um, and, um, and I think one, one thing that this means is that just because your model does a good job of fitting the data, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that its parameters are correct. Um, so, so 
um, uh, um, yeah, and that, I think that's that's a, a situation which is almost always true in condensed matter physics or anything that gets above above atomic scale um, uh, scale physics. So we we, I mean, we do have quite a lot of experience with things like that, but I think how to think of them in terms of seriously, once you take models or not, is something which is still really um, uh, really in development, and I think will be more so even at the, the tissue tissue level. Yeah, um, I know in. Daniel, you're muted. Directly. No, you're muted, Daniel. Oh, sorry. Um, no, I was asking Hannah, do you want to ask your question directly? I guess. Um... Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Ben. Uh, so I've, hey. I've always been a really big fan of this kind of formulation of sloppiness and so on. So I, my question is about whether there has been um, you know, you can point us to any uh, experimental validation of the, you know, like, did anybody actually take one of these models, made the parameter independent, you know, over the matter one bit to the behavior of the system or vice versa, that the combination that these, you know, the these, these uh, you know, long, the directions in the parameter space um, that that one of them matters a lot or some combination of them matters a lot um, I I mean that could be a yeah. way for model a very different way new way of model validation or cross validation right um, uh, what one possible answer um, is 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 Tim's talk that's coming next um, um, in, in some ways, uh, not quite what you described, but but um... I, I think I can give you some examples. And actually, it can be more complex. So for example, uh, in uh, for example, in some cases for gene mutation, you know, actually it doesn't always cause disease. So it means yeah, in some persons, this gene mutation, you, if you, or you not cause something, it doesn't affect the behavior of this person. It happens a lot. I mean, you cannot. No, no, but that could be for many yeah, reasons, let's, right? Let's, let's come back to this in the general discussion. I think this is a very oh, good okay. point for the general discussion. And I think there's also a question of uh, of Yane Kondev, which will be really good, and maybe we can start the general discussion with um, uh, with that. So why don't we go on to um, uh, to Tim? Great. Okay. Well, we're going to start the third and final talk for this session, which is Tim O'Leary from the University of Cambridge. Thanks, James. Can you hear me okay? Yes, but we can't see your slides yet. Yeah, I'm uh, going to pull that up now, hopefully. Okay, how does that look? That's good. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I thank the organizers and everyone who's talked so far. Um, a lot of what I want to say has been set up or has been preempted not only in this session, but by earlier sessions. So I'm really enjoying this, this workshop. I'm gonna dive right in and describe an experimental system uh, that I've spent some time studying and is a, a really good um, sort of poster child for uh, sloppiness manifesting in even in precise biological measurements. And that system is, the, um, is a ganglion in the Jonah crab uh, cancer borealis called the stomatic gastric ganglion. It's highlighted here in green. And there's a circuit inside the stomatic gastric ganglion, central pattern generating circuit, and its sole job is to maintain uh, this rhythm, this triphasic rhythm, which controls the contraction of digestive muscles in the animal. And one of the remarkable things about this preparation is, unlike very complicated nervous systems, this is still complicated, but unlike something like you know the human brain, you can actually go into two different animals and find the same neuron. So you can find the same LP cell in two different animals and it does the same job. So that lends itself to asking the question of whether the same function is subserved by, if you like, a different underlying biological solution. So if uh, indeed one were to measure the properties of these cells, and that's just depicted here by the uh, voltage waveform taking place inside these cells, these are two different cells in two different animals, these waveforms, uh, as we've seen in earlier talks, depend on the ionic currents flowing into the cells, which can be precisely measured. And across uh, multiple animals and preps, 
what's seen in these crucial currents, and the, these currents really are essential for this uh, firing pattern, there's a very large uh, range of variations. So on a sort of ratio metric scale or log scale, there's a three to five fold range in these conductances. And for perspective, if you were to try and build a model using that level of variability, you would almost certainly not find this type of, of behavior uh, by accident. Um, now, later work, uh, again, which is from Eve Manda's lab, um, my collaborator and previous mentor, um, dissected out these cells and then looked at the RNA levels in the individual cells responsible for these currents. And they found something striking. They found, again, a huge amount of variability, but they found that the variability was strongly correlated. So yes, things vary, but they also co-vary. And if you look at this and think back to Ben's talk, this looks, this almost has the structure of this hyper ribbon that Ben was talking about. So what we could imagine is that, yes, that we, we see this type of variability uh, across different biological parameters, the bare parameters that uh, Ben was referring to. And there are variations in this uh, parameter space that don't affect behavior. Those are the so-called sloppy directions. And then there are other directions, uh, typically orthogonal to those so-called stiff directions where system behavior could change dramatically. And it looks almost as though the biology has lined things up so that there is a lot of variability in the sloppy directions. It's just suggestive of that. We don't know that for sure. And this motivates something which I, I sort of nicknamed the sloppy regulation hypothesis, which is that if you bring in regulatory feedback control uh, into the picture, that regulatory feedback control of gross physiological properties pushes low level parameters onto sloppy manifolds. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is, take your favorite property of interest, it could be blood glucose, it could be firing uh, average calcium in a cell or something like that. It's affected by a number of components, genes, effectors, network components, whatever they happen to be. So many com combinations of these components can regulate or, or maintain a particular property. However, we know that biological systems are self-regulating. So often this high level property is fed back and it controls perhaps at the level of gene regulation, the abundance or the uh, sort of state of all of these properties. So we might bring this feedback loop into the picture. And when we do that so generically, and this is something which uh, I did in my previous work, uh, what we find is that these low level parameters then get sucked onto these kind of uh, sloppy manifolds. So in a sense, we shouldn't be that surprised, uh, first of all, by the sloppiness, as, as Ben pointed out, uh, also by the fact that there are to some degree uh, correlations in these data. And what that at least tells me is where we should look to understand this is to understand the regulatory logic. And in order to do that, we need to tease apart dynamics in space and time. And that's what this workshop is about. So this really is the right place to do that. However, it's hard. Um, in this talk, I'm not going to talk so much about regulation. I'm going to talk about modeling because that's what the previous talks have uh, focused on. And I'm going to ask this more practical problem, which is how can we approach this, this messy uh, modeling problem? So here are some examples from the literature which have struck me. Um, here is one example going back to uh, actually the stomatic asterisk ganglion was one of the examples that I chose. Uh, but um, neural modeling in general. So suppose you have a particular mechanistic model. So this is an electrical model of a cell. Uh, you might have some data from experiments, and then you might have some prior notion of what your conductance density or parameter values are. Well, one thing that you can relatively easily do is simulate uh, this uh, model and generate surrogate or synthetic data. And what we really want to do when we infer parameter values from data is solve the inverse problem. We would like to look at data and figure out what the parameters were. However, if you do this simulation exercise and you train a neural density estimator, otherwise known as a deep neural network, you can sort of approximate this inverse. You can get what's called a synthetic likelihood function for the uh, parameter distributions given the data. And these authors here uh, in Jakob Mack's group uh, in Germany applied this and they actually applied it to data from the stomatogastric ganglion with a very complicated model 
uh, with many different um, membrane conductances in it. And using this method, they were able to parameterize these uh, posterior densities of these parameter values and even move through them to generate plausible parameter values that can reproduce uh, data uh, according to whichever measurements the physiologist or experimentalist thinks are important. So this is very nice. However, there is a problem and it lurks in the back of everyone's mind when they're doing modeling. Um, what we often ask when we try to estimate parameters from data or ask, you know, what's a, a plausible range, um, we, we often perform a sort of inference exercise. Uh, and if we do this in quotes the correct way, we might invoke something like Bayes' theorem, we might say, well, we'd like to know what the posterior distribution of the parameter is given the data. And of course, this comes from the likelihood function, and this thing is typically the model that generates uh, plausible outputs and uh, a prior distribution, which we often ignore uh, or, or we take it to be uninformative. And writing this down gives us a lot of pleasure. It gives us a warm sort of fuzzy feeling because we're doing the right thing. We can extract meaning. We can extract parameters from data. But what we're really asking is assuming a particular model, what are the optimal or plausible parameter values that of that model given the data. So if we're to actually be honest and write this equation down in full, the posterior distribution depends on the data, but, but also the distribution of models. And we typically don't evaluate distributions of models. Uh, in particular, if we have the wrong model, the probability of the model is zero, which it probably is, then the inferences themselves might be vacuous. Okay. Now, there are many ways to deal with this philosophically that are not as sort of, you know, blunt as this, but there is a basic problem here. And that is that we have to confront whether we really believe the model or whether we think the model is useful, whether it actually tells us or, uh, anything interesting about the system we're studying. So even if um, we're, we're happy that this inference procedure is sound and we're actually happy that the model is, is informative, it, it, it sort of encapsulates useful hypotheses, the type of responses we might get if we, we probe complex models might look like this. So the authors of building excessively complex model with too many parameters, with that many parameters, I could get it to cook my breakfast. Okay, so why is this a problem? Conventional answers are, the model may not generalize, it's too flexible and it's simply overfitting idiosyncrasies in the data. There's wide uncertainty in the parameter estimates, which you actually saw in the previous slides I showed, and this would make experiment, uh, experimental validation of the model in particular difficult. And maybe these complex models don't really give you any insight. Okay. However, what if overfitting is actually less of a problem than we think it is in practice? And this is something we'll touch on in a moment. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, machine learning literature. Uh, um, this is uh, um, a paper asking why uh, deep neural networks don't suffer from overfitting, uh, even though they sometimes operate in a, a sort of data impoverished regime. And there's a very nice theory dealing with this. Um, what if we just accept that all of the models are wrong anyway, and we dispense with this idea of validating parameter values? And what if we can extract insight by actually breaking down a complex model? Even just because the model is complex and by eyeballing it, we can't get an understanding, doesn't mean it's, it's a bad starting point uh, for then developing a theory. So the alternative approach might look like this, focus on prediction and data assimilation. So we accept that all models are wrong. We build families of models that are rich enough to reproduce and predict observations. And then we constrain these models using potentially a lot of data. And this is now, as one of the earlier panelists uh, mentioned, this is compatible with the idea that we're entering this era of big data, where we can measure lots of things simultaneously and, and rely on our measurements a little bit more. And a striking example of this, again, in the neuroscience literature, is this paper, which builds on work by David Cicillo and others, where um, here they took a very complex system. So this is looking at uh, motor cortex in, in uh, primates, and uh, they studied the behavior of large populations of, of neurons as the animal is about to initiate a movement. 
And they took this vast data set, which is a spatial temporal data set, neural firing rates as a function of time across many neurons. And they found a way to optimize a recurrent neural network, which is really a very loosely specified network. In fact, these networks can arbitrarily well approximate any dynamical system. Tim, I just want to make sure you know you're cutting into your individual Q&A time, just so you know. OK. I, will, you should, I, will, I think you should I wind up. And wrap up pretty quick. So, so this is an example where, where you can actually do this and that there are algorithms for doing this. Um, there are potential risks. You may react and say, well, there's no hypothesis here and potentially no science taking place in the rigid sense. And the end game might be essentially a digital clone of the uh, experiment or an oracle. So we go from a situation where all models are wrong, but perhaps some are useful to one in which all the models are right, and maybe none are useful. However, we can go deeper with this. We can study the clone. We can query the structure, reduce this model uh, along the lines of the work that uh, Ben described by uh, Mark Transtrom and others. Uh, and we may be able to uh, embed structural assumptions in the model or hypotheses in the model. So we don't have to take a complete blank slate approach. And I will very quickly mention that this type of approach is being used, for example, in, in studying development. So this is an um, example uh, of the Drosophila embryo development. And the authors of this paper, which is on the archive, used a, a, a weakly structured model, but essentially was something like a neural network uh, structure inside it to, to infer um, effective coupling and dynamics between uh, different genes involved in development. So these maternal morphogens, which then set down patterns that uh, these other so-called gap genes um, then set up um, these uh, periodic patterns that determine segment development in the Drosophila. And the punchline is that this approach allowed them to take this spatial temporal data and then generate what looked like very nice predictions of not only the evolution of, of this system, but its structure as well. So sitting inside this complicated model, is a, is I think, a Tim, I think you need to jump to your conclusions. It's, yes. Uh, in four so minutes. This is where all of this leaves us. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Tim. OK, so I think we probably have time for maybe one specific question. But then after this, we go into the general Q&A. And I think Tim raised a lot of very general questions to also come up in that Q&A. But any specific questions about this? Maybe I'll ask one very specific one, but there was lots of enthusiasm. I'm sure there's gonna be lots of enthusiasm for discussion in the general q and I think people just don't wanna take the time for the one minute. So I guess one question is, you kind of pointed out how this idea about uh, regulatory feedback control is a good fit for, for DCP. And I'm wondering if you can comment a bit on what physiological systems you think we might be close to getting a good understanding of that type of feedback control. Well, one, one might be the heart, uh, actually. Um, simply because it's been studied so widely uh, over the years. We know what it does. Um, its development has been studied. And I believe that we understand to some extent how its ongoing activity regulates gene expression to some extent. Other, other tissues may include something like pancreas as well. There's similar regulatory control loops. So insulin itself affecting regulation of insulin receptors and so on. Um, in pancreatic beta cells. So there are organs or tissues where there is a function, there's some kind of identifiable pathway in the cells that support that function. And there's evidence that some physiological readout of that function in turn affects the expression or the development of the, the cells in question. Um, and I think actually the Drosophila embryo uh, development, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work there, which is really beautiful and seems to, uh, gel well with this this level of modeling where you infer these interactions between genes that are sort of turned on or turned off uh, and then you end up with something like a reaction diffusion system great okay thanks for the uh, very interesting talks and i think we're getting ready now to move into the general q a discussion so I'd like, yeah so i'd like to kick this off by some just general comments and and questions so 
I think what we've seen here in these talks together is something about the role of theory as above a level of particular modeling of particular systems. And I think they often tend to get uh, confused together, but there's, there's a role of theory at sort of a higher level. So Yun Liang talked about which aspects of variability matter, particularly in the context of the heart, but that's a very general question. And then Ben picked up on you know, why the, is biology comprehensible? You know, in some sense is a sloppiness, a bugger, a feature of the modeling. Right? And some of those things Tim picked up on, uh, um, on further and more the question of, you know, what is one trying to get from modeling and so on. And then brought up a very particular, well, first brought up a very particular context, which is a sloppy regulation and the role of regulation in maybe diminishing the bits of the sloppiness, the, the effects of the bits of the sloppiness and only keeping the effects that, uh, um, that matter, which is a pretty fundamental point about, um, about regulation as Hannah pointed out in the, in the chat. Um, but I want to sort of come to then a level of a more general and fundamental question and asking whether sloppiness is a general and crucial aspect of biology. Okay. And I think in this way, really different a way in which biology really differs from, uh, um, uh, from engineering, where all the parts are sort of designed to fit together and things very, um, very well. So is, is, can, is sloppiness really an essence of how biology actually functions? And even more so, how it can actually evolve, how complicated things that can work together evolve. And a really crucial part of that, which we heard some of in the talks already then, is about the different the range of timescales. And that, that I think we understand quite a bit in cell biology, where if we ask for say a process involving signaling or something in the cell, which happens on timescales of seconds, it doesn't really care whether some microscopic process happens on my, milliseconds or microseconds as long as it's happened. And it doesn't care whether the cell divides once, once an hour or, um, uh, or, or once a week, um, because all that matters is those are much bigger or much smaller. And that's some of the things about timescales and things being very different that, uh, that ben, um, uh, ben talked about. Um, so this is really something which is, it really helps in the understanding of cell biology, but it certainly helps crucially in how cell biology works and even more so in how it evolves, because if all you care getting a process is that some things are much faster and some things are much slower, then it's much less difficult to imagine how it, um, 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 how it evolves. Now, it seems to me this is one of the difficulties then in going from cells to tissues. So there again, we, we saw an example of this in Yang, Yang's talk, um, is that the time scales of the individual um, neurons, of the, the, the individual cells, the cardiomyocytes, are not that different than the time scales of the whole heart, of the process they're, they're doing. And we even have this in the brain is the time scales of you know, individual neurons of 10 milliseconds or, or 100 milliseconds and so on is comparable to the time scale for high level processing, like deciding whether a picture has an animal in it or not. Right? So I think there's intrinsic difficulties in some organs for that, that one doesn't have that separation of time scales and we have to try to understand how to deal with that. In other organs where the cellular processes and, and some other things are much slower flow and so on, that can be, um, um, uh, can be quite different. So I wanted to raise those just sort of, you know, as a general point as a, and as a general question, you know, how much of this is really the essence of, of, uh, of, of biology. Um, so I, one, I think this would natural then lean into Yane's um, uh, uh, question about the role of evolution that I cut him off on after Ben's talk. So Yane, do you want to pick up on, on that? Um, well, I think you kind of raised it already uh, just now, right? And uh, I don't know if, I mean, my, sorry, in terms of Ben's talk, I was just curious, um, you know, so you get these, uh, you know, networks uh, of whatever genes, proteins, all interacting, many, many parameters. And I was just, to, to the extent that these systems are evolved, I was just curious, does that put further constraints in the context of this sloppy analysis that you're doing? Because as far as I understood it right now, the analysis is kind of, here's a network, you know, it came from somewhere and let's analyze it. But I was just, you know, this would give us some sense of, you know, whatever um, is doing there, I don't know. Are, are you asking in the context of understanding what what uh, what actual reaction rates are or or more in the sense of understanding um, yeah my rates. sense is what actual rates I mean what the actual reaction rates are is kind of maybe not so for me it's not so interesting and probably hopeless sure. but, uh, but but I think in some ways I, I, in, in some ways I think Tim's talk which I thoroughly enjoyed uh, and uh, especially since I've been having all sorts of discussions with Eve lately about similar things, and um, and uh, and I think might have kind of 
gone in that direction as well. So anyway, with his feedback and how, you know, so, so that's, anyway. Well, one thing is that, um, you know, there's a lot of components that certainly interact in, in, in that signaling cascade, for example, um, but that's not the, um, that's, that's not the number of parameters that need to be tuned to get the cascade to work. Um, so I, I, uh, um, it's, it's not that evolution needs to precisely tune everything involved in the cascade um, to get it to function accurately. Maybe there's a few parameters um, you know, that need to be right for that cascade to work, um, which I think makes me feel better about the plausibility of evolution. But um, uh, I don't know if that was quite the question you were asking also. I guess I was more curious is like, is there some sense in which, and I'm sorry, I, I, this is all very vague in my head. And, and so my questions are, I understand very ill-defined Ill and vague, but is there some sense in which uh, you can imagine uh, sort of writing down some equations that say maybe evolution will tend to give you um, um, for reasons I don't understand very well, or, you know, neutral drift, maybe something like that, you tend to give you uh, networks of the variety that you're describing, right? Maybe, maybe I, mean, I can take a cut at that. I mean, I think this is one of those general sort of higher level theory questions and is coming to the question is how good a Occam's razor in is, uh, um, is evolution, right? I mean, in some ways it's the only Occam's razor we have in biology is, is uh, evolution, so how good is that? And I think this nice example actually on oscillators in cells is the, the Leibler and uh, Elowitz oscillator, what is an amazing technical achievement, but it was really, really difficult for to get them to work. Biology tends to use relaxation oscillators, which are much more robust and they're much easier to evolve because you just need the separation of the, of the time scales and the nonlinearities and things. So I think it, there are some cases at least where it really is, does serve as a good Occam's razor, but that I think is, is a general issue. It's gonna come up in, in, in many contexts. So Tim has his hand up for a little bit. Do you wanna come chime in, Tim? Do you have something? Muted. Sorry, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to respond to one of the early things Daniel said is, is he asked this question is, is this sloppiness thing a biological thing? Uh, I used to think it was, and I got corrected by my engineer friends. And I got given this fabulous story about the development of the operational amplifier by Bodhi. And there's this quote which says, well, you know, I had this mess of electronics in front of me, and I wanted to de develop this device that had um, a reliable gain. And in the end, I understood it by lumping everything together and describing a transfer function for the whole system. Had I broken it down to write down ODs, I would have had 55 equations in front of me. So the, the, the type of sloppiness uh, that we're talking about exists there as well. In some cases, because of design, it's easier to ignore. And the, the same point was really raised by Ben as well, discussing diffusion or um, you know the effect of uh, hydrogen bonds or, or, you know, bond angles on, on solutes and so on. So, so I think for me that the major issue with biology is it has no choice sometimes but to act on these low level uh, comp components. So you have this sloppy relationship between the low level parameters and the high level function, but regulation often works by acting on the low level components themselves. So that, that's where I think the, the real conundrum lies. And then if you lay evolution on top of that as well, it needs to be able to adapt uh, to some extent. You might imagine that many organisms are selective for their adaptability, particularly bacteria and things like that. And then maybe Hannah, your hand is also up for the lobby. Do you want to come and chime in? Yeah, so, so I would actually comment on that and you know maybe, maybe ask a question that uh, Noah Alsman put in the chat, which is, um, what part so so in control theory we don't talk about uh, sloppiness we actually talk about robustness which seems to have the same definition as sloppiness robustness is defined as uh, you know the use of uh, so so you you take a system it's robust if some output of it is robust if you take the parameters shake them around and the function the output of that system doesn't change which seems to be kind of an, an identical definition to what this notion of sloppiness we're talking about is. And if so, 
then can we reconcile these two notions? And then if there is a, 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 a part of sloppiness that is not explained by this notion of robustness that is usually achieved through the use of feedback loops, then maybe we can talk about that. So can we separate these things or maybe it's exactly the same thing or maybe there is a different dimension to sloppiness that is on top the, of this notion of, of robustness. I don't know if that makes sense, but I am myself confused by these definitions right now. Can I just jump in quickly, Hannah? I, I, I agree with that. What I would say is, and I would like to hear from the others, is the difference between sloppiness and robustness is there are stiff directions. So I, I think of sloppiness as really just the sensitivity. It's characterizing the sensitivity of, of a system. And you're right, that to make a system robust, you often use feedback to reject variations in stiff directions. And then what you end up with is a robust system. But it's robust because there's feedback. The sloppiness I think we're describing might be something like open loop sensitivity, I think. But I'd like to hear from other control theorists what they think. Yeah, I think maybe we should move on to other other aspects. I mean, there's one question in the general Q&A from Phil Nelson. In crab ganglion, you describe wide natural variation. Are there imposed ablation, et cetera, experiments that artificially modify things in ways predicted not to matter? And how did they turn out? So, and what's the answer to that or in, or in a... Is either anybody know? What about the people working on the STG? Presumably. Well, yes. maybe if someone does, because it's quite a specific question, they can answer it right in the in the uh, in the Q and A. So, um, but maybe Kristen, I think um, you had some um, uh, comments and things to. Um, you don't have your hand up now, but um, Daniel, I just brought on um, Panjak and um, Genevieve, and I think they may have some questions or comments. Uh, okay, uh, Pankaj. Uh, yeah. Well, if you want to move on, it's okay. Maybe we can go on to the other topics. I just had a thought about the difference between feedback, uh, between well, robustness. Well, yeah, why don't you, why don't you, um, yeah. Okay, well, so I, I, think, I think one of the things that uh, Tim pointed to that is really interesting going on in machine learning is that st we had statistics completely wrong, right? The idea that over-parameterized models work basically tells us that classic intuitions of bias or variance were completely wrong, or at least incomplete, right? And that, I think, tells us something very deep about how you have to count the number of constraints you have in a system and the number of degrees of freedom. And there seem to, seems to be no penalty for programming in function into a complex system, except for more computational costs if you have many, many degrees of freedom. That's what we understand as modern statistics. This is the double descent phenomenon. And exactly I think, what I was going to talk about. So uh, yeah. I'm glad you brought it. Uh, yeah. So, so, so I, it's, it's also in my talk tomorrow. But I think it also hints at one of the limitations of this way of thinking and machine learning in general, which is the reason you can learn stuff, even when you have many more degrees of freedom than, say, data points or constraints, is because you're basically interpolating your training data set. I think we have papers showing that lots of I think that would be a consensus. So, I think what theory can do that perhaps this kind of data stuff that Tim was talking about can't do is it can inter it can make predictions in a completely novel context. And I still don't understand how you can do that, right? So on one hand, this literature tells us that learning in complex systems is much easier than we think, but also hints that learning in a novel context is much harder, which is again for evolution another relevant problem. So I, I'll just shut up after now. You know, maybe I'll kind of quickly chime in and just say that I think something else would be really interesting to discuss. It's a bit different than what we've done so far. Is that you know, given that we're here as part of this full DCP uh, workshop, to think a little bit about how these lessons associated with sloppiness shape the types of experiments and uh, data sets that Julian should be collecting. So, for example, in his talk, Tim talked a lot about the importance of regulatory mechanisms and that this might be the kind of thing we could tackle. Ben mentioned, for example, model reduction. Uh, you know, so to that extent. Would building massive models with massive numbers of parameters be useful? I'd be interested to kind of hear all the panelists reflect a little bit on what it is that, for example, might be productive for Genelia to do given its uh, new efforts in these areas. 
So I guess Genevieve was uh, and originally. Um, so I mean, I have thoughts on that, but that's not why I had my hand raised. The other, th I just wanted to echo the, um, I'm excited to hear your talk on double descent, but also just in terms of definitions and words throughout the idea of thinking about it, maybe in terms of the difference between constraint and parsimony, because biology doesn't really have parsimony in the way that we typically think of it in a model system. And I think kind of viewing it through that lens is, can also be really helpful. Yeah, I think there's a related question on that, which is what one sort of expects or doesn't expect coming back to something in Ned's comment about optimality of thinking of an organism being optimized for something. And I also, mean, I'm especially having worked in evolution quite a bit, very skeptical about arguments about um, um, optimality because one really has very little idea what a cell cares about, like what gene expression a cell cares about, never mind what a multicellular organism and thing sometimes really cares about. There are obviously a few, some exceptions to that and very concrete um, um, exceptions. And I think some of those exceptions are actually where something is so optimal that it's going to be hard to explain. And the most famous example is bacterial chemotaxis, where you know realization that it's doing something close to a limit, then by definition, it's it's doing it, uh, um, um, doing it, doing it, uh, um, uh, doing it optimally. Can I jump in, Dan? Yes. Okay. So, so, so I think in terms of what you know, you, I don't know who asked. It was James asked a question about what Janelia can you know like can can jump in. Um, I think it has been since you know people started talking about systems biology and so on. If you know some 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 decades ago, there always has been this tension between uh, you know, small scale models, large scale models, parameterization, model reduction, what's a good model, what's a bad model. And that tension has never disappeared. Uh, and these different camps of, of scientists who are building models, they separated. And then there were the people building statistical models that also assume their own camp. And I'm being prov provocative here on purpose. And I think what we're discussing today is a possible connection between the different types of modelers and theorists uh, and an opportunity to actually bring them together to sort this out once and for all, uh, not to, you know, not, not to declare one, one type of modeling on what type of theory as superior to another, but actually to find the connections and how we can move back and forth between these different areas based on the questions that we want to ask out of a model. So it seems Maybe to me I there can, is actually yeah. a, a good place for synergy here that Janelia can, can help facilitate. So maybe I can add, add something to that and it comes a bit to the sociological question as well. So, you know, one of the, the huge successes of, of condensed matter physics and which has very close ties between experimental theory on short times and scales is the appreciation of the roles of theory all the way from the, the sort of abstract ideas, general ideas, to people who are very mathematical, can solve models that exist already better than, than anyone else, to people who work very closely with the, the, um, with the experimentalists and very close to data and things, and all the ways in between. And different people have their preference and things, but there's appreciation that all of those bits are important. And so I think a crucial thing, and I think that Hannah Zinning, that one has to get away from these camps, people who like this and that and so on. One thing I do think we need to solve is misuse of the word model in a different context. And there's so much difference between statistical model and causative model often that one really would be nice to have different words for uh, um, uh, uh, words for them. And then unfortunately, I think neuroscience is suffering from that more than it did in the past. I think in some ways it's gone a bit downhill that, uh, that way as one hears people talking about models in that sense, even though it's a field that overall has a higher appreciation of, of theory than most areas of, uh, of, of biology. Other comments? I guess we've got time left for... Um, for um... Well, I, I'm excited to hear the um, session on machine learning uh, which is tomorrow, because the other thing, going back to James's question, is Janelia is poised to marry this sort of vast data collection exercise and experimental exercise and measurement exercise with uh, experts in, in ML. 
And that's sort of the, the first half of, of what I was arguing might be a way through this, this kind of big problem. Uh, and then the second phase might be actually interrogating what, what's in the guts of these inferred models yeah. and throwing theory at that problem. So, Kristen, do you want to have the last word on, on that? Or, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the, the topics that I'd really love to explore in this workshop um, uh, is, is, yeah, how, how machine learning, you know, fitting models like the ones that Timothy described can, can interact with the So I think we lost you, or at least I lost you. The, um, did you mute, mute yourself? I think, I think we lost her. She'll be back in a moment. Go ahead, Kristen. You still have the, you still have the mic. Okay. Um, I was just saying that, um, I mean, I think this is one of the things that I'd really like to explore with this workshop, that, uh, you know, there is this, you know, the, the machine learning and theory are coming closer together. Um, and you know, the type So you broke up again, because you said they're coming closer together and the type, and then you froze. I, th I think my network is not good enough to say things. So I'll, I'll just let you guys go ahead. Okay, but I think the essence of it was that, you know, yes to all the above, and that these conversations will continue for many of the future sessions as well. And so I think with that, we can kind of take the next break before the final session of the day. Perfect. Thank you. So we're running just a little bit behind. Let's um, let's take just a five minute break and we'll resume about um, 246 Eastern.